is the second lecture by Emmanuel, and um, is, is it beyond density functional theory? Or dynamic theory. Dynamic theory. Yes. I, I thought I was, you know, I would be happy enough to learn what dynamic field theory is, but you're going to teach us dynamical mean field theory and also beyond? So uh, I'll start with <laughs> dynamical mean field theory. <laughs> okay, so we'll uh, learn both and beyond. All right, let's welcome Emmanuel. All right. Yeah, so the goal of this lecture, so first of all, the style of this lecture is completely different to the style of the last lecture. Uh, this one should actually have some physics content, but in case uh, this goes too fast or too complicated, um, let me know and I'll try to slow down and explain a little bit more. Um, what I would like to do is uh, illustrate the dynamical medial theory. So, so I guess most of you have heard that acronym at some place or other. Uh, I would like to derive it in a way that is maybe not quite standard, but in a way that I hope illustrates where the approximations are and sort of what the tricky points are and what are the points that uh, that approximation probably will get right. And for that, I would like to start from a completely general electronic structure I'm not in, um, where I have capital N orbitals here, uh, some hopping matrix element Pij, Cij here. Dj plus some sum over general four index uh, integrals ijkl, which also go over all of my orbitals. Uh, an interaction, which I would like to have completely general, uh, i dagger c k dagger c l c j. All right. So yes. As they suggested to me, the fatter chalk is easier to see. Oh. <laughs> you don't want to be so, the only person being concerned with that DD, right? No, but it is true. It's hard to see. It. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 I don't probably. Uh, yeah. If, if it remains hard to see, protest, please, and uh, I'll try to uh, improve. Good. So, you know, special. Cases of this would be a Hubbard model where you just have a P and a U, and most of these terms are zero, or uh, uh, and, and the U would then be completely un, uh, on site. So at this point, I would like to go back to the 1960s to a beautiful paper that comes out of uh, Luttinger and Ward. Uh, of which I will you know, make some statements, and you're going to have to go back and read the original paper, which is really beautiful and, and fully self-contained, to, to get the derivations uh, in, in such a way that we can uh, talk about the approximations. Um, what they said is that if we have a grand potential of a system like that, then we can express the grand potential of a quantum system as, well, omega, that's my grand potential, should essentially be something which has to do with the Green's function, something which has to do with the Green's function and the self-energy, and an additional term, which I call phi, which is a functional of the Green's function. So let me write here that G is the Green's function. Sigma is the self-energy. And phi the so-called Luttinger Ward functional
consists of all close link skeleton diagrams. Let me stop here. Who here has seen the Luttinger word functional formalism? Okay, good. Who here has worked with this? Okay, most of you have not. Um, doesn't matter. I will state this here and I will use it to construct approximations. Let me just illustrate what I mean by close linked skeleton diagrams. Uh, what I mean by this is if I have this function of the Green's function, then that in terms of diagrams consists of diagrams that look like this where I have Green's function lines here and Bayer interactions lines here and Luttinger and Ward derived that I should draw all possible ways of linking these diagrams those are the ones with one interaction uh, those are the ones with two interaction lines um, uh, add this is called the second order exchange diagram. And if I sum up all the contributions from all the diagrams that have Green's function lines here that are closed, meaning they have no open ends, that are linked, meaning they don't fall apart into two, uh, two different parts, and their skeletons, uh, well, let's just say that they have this green function line here. Then, what if I sum up all of these, then I will get uh, the grand uh, potential here. So that looks uh, useless uh, or highly theoretical and not like a good starting point to actually get anything done. Um, let me just say that if I have that Luttinger Ward functional, then I can extract from it the self-energy as simply taking this series of diagrams here, taking scissors, cutting one of those lines, right? And if I look at this in terms of diagrams, I get a sigma as a function of g here is well, the Hartree diagram plus the Hopf diagram. <coughs> Let me draw it like that. Plus second order diagrams like this one here. Right, plus all higher diagrams. <coughs> All right, so that here is a theoretical formalism that's been derived in 1960 by these two guys that gives you a way of diagrammatically expressing uh, the grand potential. Good. Once we have that, the question is why is any of this useful? And just a year later, um, Baim and then Baim and Karanov said, In 1961 and 1962, if we take a subset of diagrams of phi, System self consistency, self consistently, then 
it will automatically respect certain conservation laws. Is grand potential some? Is is it a physical thing, or is it just a calculational tool? Is it related to some thermodynamic potential? It is a thermodynamic potential, right? The the grand yeah, potential F of statistical mechanics. Exactly. Uh -huh. Right. Of a, of a quantum system. And how do we know that's true? Um, I don't have time to derive that here, uh -huh. uh, but this is something that you should really do in an afternoon because this paper has been written sort of completely self-contained. Mm -hmm. This is just statistical mechanics, uh, green function formulas, and derive line by line until you, you arrive at an expression like this. The only reason why I have this expression like this is you know this now has all of the closed link skeleton diagrams. Mm -hmm. Those guys says, well it's actually, you know, if you just take some of these diagrams, what you are you'll get is an approximation. Mm -hmm. Right? That approximation is guaranteed to satisfy a couple of useful conservation laws, and that is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for constructing you know, approximations. And so from this, we can now go and write down files that contain a subset of all possible diagrams. Um, for example, we can say that our phi functional should, should be the Hartree Fock phi functional, which simply consists of this diagram plus this diagram. Well, let me write it down. All right. So that is the Hartree Fock approximation. Um, automatically satisfies some conservation laws. That's your standard mean field approximation. I can say that I would like to start from the Hartree Fock approximation and add all of my second order terms to it. Right, and that gives you the self consistent. Second order uh, Born approximation or GF2 approximation. I can say that I like diagrams that have these uh, bubbles here. I want to take this one, the second order one, add the third order bubble diagram. And the fourth order, and the fifth order, and the sixth order, and so on, I can write these down or sum these up in an efficient uh, geometric series. And what I'll get is the so called self consistent GW or the RPA approximation. All of these, by construction, are guaranteed to satisfy these conservation laws and a couple of other nice properties, uh, like, for example, coupling constant integrations or thermodynamic consistency, and so on. Um, so this is a useful scheme for designing approximations or lower uh, diagrammatic approximations, and most of the ones that we've heard of satisfy this criterion in, in uh, some way. So, um, do we do we know when we decide to select some subset? Do we know what kind of approximation it is? Yeah. Um, for example, these are interaction, like they are interaction lines, right? What you see here in this approximation, or in this approximation up here, you have all the terms with one B, right? Part of mm -hmm. Here you have all the terms up to second order. Okay. Here you have 
terms up to infinite order, but only of that certain, you know, bubble. Yes, uh, that's organization of the diagrams, but right. in terms of like, in some physical way, when is that, is there, like, I guess I'm asking, is there a small parameter, or do we learn, do we learn in what limit that approximation is valid? We coupling for those two, right? Um, for those here, for GW, anybody's guess, right? What you're... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, in particular, what you see that in GW, let me put it right here, find GW and find GF2, right? For GW, right, the, the best way of seeing what doesn't work is the fact that you don't get the second order in the interaction in here. <coughs> so you would not expect to be, uh, this to be valid for longer than even just mean field, right? There are exceptions if you can guarantee that this diagram goes to zero. And you know, uniform electron gas high density is, is one of the things. Mm -hmm. But typically, this here doesn't tell you that it's a good idea to pick certain diagrams. Mm -hmm. It only tells you that if you pick certain diagrams in here and you solve it self consistently, then you're guaranteed to have a couple of conservation laws that you would expect a good approximation to fulfill. Mm -hmm. All right? So this now gives you a way of systematically constructing approximations. There's a couple questions. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, when you are saying solving self consistently, you mean self consistent with what? Which equation? Like the self energy equation? In here, I have a G. Which is a bare G. Yeah? This here is actually a full G. Oh, this is the full. So, what that means is I have an equation here that has a full G in here. I have an equation here that, given that phi gives me my self energy, mm -hmm. and I have a Dyson equation, so, you know. That, that relates uh, my sigma back to g. In practice, often it's done in this way that you're plugging in a gas for a g, for example, a non-interacting Green's function. You're getting a self-energy back out of this, right? You're resolving a Dyson equation. You get the new updated g, you plug that back in, and you keep doing that until hopefully it converges. There are examples where this iterative procedure so doesn't converge. For example, if I start with r to four thing, then I will get this geometric series. Usually, people write for the Green's function with itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so that that will be this one. This is exactly your geometric series. Yes. Uh, so, what, we are dropping some of the diagrams and choosing some specific diagrams with some motivations. Mm -hmm. So, can we see that uh, if I uh, add some of the diagrams which I have dropped, how they will affect the calculation of the series consistency? Um, so you can certainly go into these functionals and add additional terms to this. And you can ask, you know, if I keep adding diagrams of a certain type, do I get a net result that is better? Um, when you have a small parameter, like here, the interaction, you know, we coupling, you can go to third order, fourth order, fifth order. You'd expect it to be valid for a little bit longer. But in general, it's not the case that as you keep adding more diagrams, you're getting a better result. You're just getting a different result. So one has to be careful. I mean, these things are a little bit tricky, right? They're, they're, you can't just start here and then keep adding terms and hope for this. There are also things that these approximations don't guarantee you. For example, they don't guarantee to respect the Pauli principle, which is something you would really like to have. GW here does not do that, right? You uh, would like them to be causal. None of this guarantees that. So, so there, there, there are lots of, there's lots of fine print uh, in here. The reason why I write this down is that once you have the exact solution with all the diagrams, right, you can talk about kicking out some of those and looking at subsets of these. And really, the only reason why I have this here, other than to show you, you know, a couple of popular diagrams like the RP Falk, the GSU, and the GW, is that you can formulate the DMFP or the dynamical mean field theory in this framework. Right. So what did General Ward tell you? That you should sum all diagrams and get the exact solution. That's a nice statement, but it's of course completely useless to get anything done because you can't sum all of these diagrams. What about with diagrammatic Monte Carlo? If the series is convergent, then yes. And this is how diagrammatic Monte Carlo is actually formulated. Right? You're actually 
generating diagrams here of that plugging award series. You're then identifying here green function lines which you cut in order to measure the self energy. Right? You do that until your self energy precision is high enough, at which point you run the Dyson equation, update your green function, and repeat it. That's exactly how diagrammatic Monte Carlo works, but in this lecture, I don't have time to go yeah, into that. You can also see how it fails. Right? Diagrammatic Monte Carlo will run off to higher and higher orders if those diagrams are relevant. Here, outside the weak coupling limit, there's no reason why it should not be relevant. Anyway, let me take one of those diagrams. And I have Green's functions and interaction lines. Let me label these different T, S, Q, L, P, right? Let me let, label these different indices over here. These are just the orbital indices that I have in my V, I, J, K, L, that is still in uh, fine print up there, <laughs> right? And now let me do the dynamical mean field approximation. DMFT says that the only diagrams that you're going to sum up are the ones which have the same orbital index at every single point. And I'm just going to call it I here. So the DMFT approximation is the approximation that takes only those diagrams out of all diagrams that have the same orbital index at every single point. So DMFT says sum up all uh, diagrams with the same orbital index. But do that. to infinite <coughs> order, right? And we'll have to develop a machinery that will allow you to sum up these diagrams up to infinite order. But here you see the basic sort of classification of those different diagrams, right? hartree fock GF2, GW were really you know, weak coupling approximations. You took a couple of low order diagrams or an infinite series of these diagrams that you liked, right, and you kicked out most of the other diagrams, definitely all of those that had uh, higher uh, um, vertices in there. But in those approximations, you have the fully general orbital indices attached to every single one of those interaction lines. In DMFT, you give up the fact that you have general orbital indices attached to these. But instead, you sum up all of the diagrams non perturbatively up to infinite order. Anyway, the first consequence that you get out of this is if you look at the self energy, sigma, which really is just d phi by dg. And if you allow me to put order indices here, and sigma ij is divided by dg ji, right? If we have the same orbital indices everywhere, then the self energy will be zero. Zero. Unless, uh, except. Or sigma i i. In other words, the self energy that you're getting out of the dynamical mean field theory will be local to the orbital that you have. Right? You're not going to get any sort of non-local uh, self energies. Or if we write down sigma as a matrix, right? You'll get 
sigma 1, 1 for the first order move to sigma 2, 2 for the next order move. And that will keep going and is 0 everywhere uh, else. Now, if I here denotes a site on a lattice and you have one orbital per lattice site, right? <coughs> then that means that the surface energy is local in real space. And that is a typical interpretation that you hear from the MFT, that the MFT will give you back a local self energy. Here I have actually never assumed that, uh, that, that these eyes are local orbitals in a lattice. They could be orbitals in a molecule or orbitals you know, multiple orbitals in a, in a cluster. So the only thing that we have here is that the self energy has to be local uh, to all of these uh, orbitals. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, Just to ask, uh, so, so the way we have defined the self energy, so is that uh, we cut one of the uh, lines over there? Yep. The top figure. So you take scissors so here. Right. Right? You cut out this, this line here, mm -hmm. and the self energy is then, well, here you go, whatever is left out of that. Right. That's what is meant by the deep energy. Uh, so, what is the motivation of, uh, inter so, so in, in the internal uh, lines, uh, initially could have been uh, any uh, orbital index, right? Mm -hmm. Many orbital index to be mm -hmm. precise. Now, in the DMFT, we are choosing that internally it does not change the orbital index mm -hmm. and adding all the possible diagrams. Mm -hmm. So, how that compensate for the fact that it could have gone into many orbitals and we could have added up into, like on the left hand side, we have chosen order by order in the weak interaction. And this can give you some important results? Sure. Uh, so, uh, well, first of all, it will give you something different, right? And it will be different because <laughs> it, it is an approximation. Right? The approximation that you're making here is that you're neglecting any sort of self-energy contribution that comes from, uh, well, non-local terms. Now, if the physics that you're interested in has to do with local self-energies going through rapid changes, for example, going to zero in a metal and going to infinity in a mocked insulator, and that's really carried by the local self-energy, you're going to get a strong signal here in the UFT. You're going to need a non perturbative treatment of this, right? The, the, these sort of weak coupling series are not going to give you that. But of course, you're going to miss everything that has to do with non local self energies. So I'll, I'll discuss this in, in just a bit. I mean, this is an important point, but this is the approximation that is behind the dynamic domain filter. Exactly this, right? You declare that all of the terms that have different orbital indices are just not important. Yes. Yeah. So if I do a change of basis so that the orbitals are different, do we expect this approximation will give us the same answer? Or no? Uh, no, it will give you a different answer. Um, that historically, um, so, so, so historically, all of these orbital indices that I have, they were not generalized orbital indices. They were rating real space indices of atoms on a lattice. Right? You have a hover model. You have sites numbered from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right? And they would then be here, you know, the local self energy on this side or on the next side as well. And because it's inflationally invariant, right, all of these self energy would actually be the same. Uh, but, but let me move on a little bit and, and, and I'll actually come back to that. Right? But that's an important point. Um, right. So um, now we have a procedure to actually calculate this, right? Uh, the procedure says we should build the self energy in here like this. Um, we should then compute the Green's function via the Dyson equation, right? Just write the Dyson equation here as g is equal to g0 plus g0 sigma g, right? We have a, a, an assumption for the self-energy or an approximation for the self-energy. We know what the non-interacting Hamiltonian is doing and its Green's function. We can estimate or obtain a g here for some approximate sigma, consider it zero at first. Take that g, plug it in here, compute the lucky reward functional and the sigma equals d by dg. Right? Update our sigma, it will still be diagonal, but the values will now be different presumably. Update the g, update the phi and the sigma, update the g, 
update, define the sigma, update the gene, all the way until you get convergence. In practice, you know, surprisingly, it actually turns out that this convergence has never any convergence problems. Always converges very, very nicely to a single uh, solution, unless the physics itself is such that you're getting uh, quite systems uh, of multiple uh, solutions. All right. So let me discuss this a little bit, and we've already mentioned a bit here. So the first point is really. And this is actually a point that is, is not discussed as, as extensively as really it should be, is we started out with the VIJKL, right, my general interactions, but then I restricted myself to only diagrams with VIIII, right? That is a huge approximation. It's actually the leading approximation if you're doing this for any sort of realistic system. If you're doing this on a Hubbard model, well, you only have all that side interactions to start with, so this doesn't even bother you uh, uh, here, right? But any interorbital interaction is lost. And that now limits you in the type of physics that you'll get out of this. So the second point, which is also more or less clear, is that even local interactions will give rise to non-local self-energies. That's uh, a bit of a trivial statement if you think about it for long enough. But if I just if I'm explicit about it here, and I look at this second order diagram, and I label this here as J, and this here as I, then you can see that this self energy diagram is a contribution to sigma I J, right? Even though it has only local interactions, this is a local, local interaction in orbital J, and this is one in, in, in orbital line, right? So, uh, uh, you know, those non-local self-energies are not in the MFT. Okay. So, um, that sets up the approximation. Uh, what is sort of missing in all of this is that we need a machine that will take a Green's function and will compute me uh, for me the Lotting reward function or the self energy non perturbatively to all or you know given that local interaction. And that is so we need a machine for computing uh, G or sigma given AG. And that is where the impurity model construction uh, comes in. Um, let's say here this is the impurity solver. So <coughs> the bare propagation of the Hamiltonian is is G0, the best defined as G0 inverse is, let me write this as I omega m plus mu times delta ij minus e ij. That's the non-interacting uh, propagation. The full 
propagator topology is well, the G inverse, which is what we here defined as by the Dyson equation, is I omega m plus mu delta mj minus t ij minus sigma ij. Let me absorb all the one body term here in T and write the G0 inverse just for orbital i and the rest in matrix form. G0 inverse is, well, i omega n minus Tii, or Tii is just this here. Ti rest, T rest I, and well I omega minus T rest. And the TRs are just matrices that absorb all of the contributions from uh, different orbitals. G inverse is not much more complicated. I omega n uh, minus Tii minus sigma ii. We have a self-energy here in the same orbital, pir, uh, pri, and I omega minus pr minus sigma r. And really, I can write this as G0 inverse minus sigma ii. I need an ii here. Uh, G0 inverse ir, G0 inverse ri, and G0 inverse r r minus sigma r. As a propagator, in that functional, we're going to need to have g. What I have here is an expression for g inverse. Um, what is i and r for? i here is a site on which I want to, let me write here, so I want to focus on a site i and I denote everything else as R for the rest. So I have a self energy matrix in here. Let me, for example, take out here the first row and column called is II. I R, R I, and R R in block matrix form. So I, I had an expression on the board, I have it behind this one here for G inverse, what I really need is an expression for G, right? Um, let's look at a block matrix inversion. Uh, if I have a matrix A, which is P, Q, R, and S, and I look at its inverse, which is given as p tilde, q tilde, r tilde, and s tilde, then p tilde here can be expressed in terms of p, q, r, and s as p tilde is p inverse plus p inverse q s minus r e inverse q inverse r q inverse. Um, easiest
easiest way to prove this is you just do an LU decomposition, you just do a matrix inversion of this uh, and, and look at uh, this uh, term. But this here gives, if we look at G inverse as PQRNS, gives G ionic, the propagator in the block that I care about, as, well, G naught inverse. I I minus sigma I I uh, plus complicated terms that have you know many mixed things here that have inverses of whatever they're too complicated for me so I'll give them a name I will just simply call them delta I I right. And the definition of the delta ii is this here, which is uh, the inverse of that or that matrix here, which I will tell you later. I really don't need to know in this uh, form because it's uh, useless. It contains unknown quantities. Um, look at this expression over here. If we modify our bare propagator here, as G naught inverse is G zero inverse I I minus delta I I, then that thing looks like a Dyson equation, has the same interactions. And we have an auxiliary system that is now only dependent on these ii indices, which when we sum it up, when we sum up all of the diagrams, will give us sigma ii and gii. That definition of the bare propagator for that uh, auxiliary system, right, that is the definition of the purity bare James function here, which is a, the original variance function that you had modified by a so-called hybridization function. Unfortunately, when we do that, of course, delta is unknown, right? It's a very complex object. It has information about all the other orbitals in the lattice, but it allows us to define an iterative procedure where we Assume some delta Delta zero is a good assumption No hybridization whatsoever, but it can be anything else then solve The problem Where out of the G zero and V, your bare interaction, you're getting the sigma i i. This can be done numerically with a so-called impurity solver. Evaluate your Green's function extract the GII in the order line compute G0 inverse SGII inverse plus sigma II update delta and iterate. And solve this to convergence. So now we have a machine that lets you forget about the entire lattice that is out there and only works in that subset ii. It's based on a, <coughs> an assumption of some impurity or hybridization function delta, which you know, it can set to zero initially. Uh, or to some other 
uh, value that you like. Um, you then, out of the delta compute to G0, you use a so-called impurity solver to get from a G0 and to V to your local self-energy. You plug your local self-energy into a Dyson equation. Out of the Dyson equation, you get the next iteration G0 and delta, which you can then update, plug in here, run your impurity solver, solve your Dyson equation, compute the next iteration, right? plug it in here, solve your impurity sol uh, problem, and so on. So with this, we have taken the somewhat abstract formalism of Lutting your own work, and an approximation that has told us to only ever look at the local self-energy, or only ever look at local diagrams and kick out all other possible diagrams. And we have turned it into something that is numerically tractable, which now only consists of solving a local problem. There are only i i indices in this problem. So it's still a non-interacting quantum problem that we need to solve non-perturbatively. But we can do that using powerful numerical methods, obtain a self-energy, and then iterate this until you reach uh, achieve convergence. So we went from you know, 1960s many-body theory to a practical prescription of obtaining uh, uh, self-energies uh, of uh, that form. A couple of comments on that, or questions about this. So a couple of comments are in order. Of course, the first comment is nobody will bring back the diagrams that we kicked out, right? So the VIJKL that we started with and kicked out, you know, except for the VIIII, that is gone. It will never come back, right? Um, so anything that comes out of non-local interactions is lost. Typically, what is done in practice when people try to say something about realistic materials is they invoke screening. They manually adjust their interactions to something that is you know, more an effective interaction, uh, typically much smaller, to try to compensate for the non-local interactions and run this with these adjusted local interactions. That's an ad hoc procedure. Um, it's a free parameter in your theory that you can tune in order to get the results that you like. So this is one of the places where you have to be very careful. The second approximation is, of course, that all the self-energy is sigma ij, where i was not equal to j, are lost. So unless your physics really is dominated by local or, or local phenomena or, or intraorbital phenomena where self-energy does something you know, from low, from small to very large, uh, you're not going to get that feature. A lot of the interesting physics, for example, in the group rates, uh, is given by self-energies which are not local. And single side EMFT, that uh, variant here, which is just a single orbital, is of course uh, going to miss that. So you have a choice of orbitals. Does uh -huh. choosing localized orbitals help? It's not clear because it's not clear how to localize these orbitals in an unambiguous way. And even then, if you look at the non-local matrix elements, there's no reason why they should be zero. Right. So, so uh, uh, there, there's a lot of fine print behind this. And what people do in practice is they manually adjust these. They localize the orbitals, and they manually adjust the interactions to try to compensate for kicking out all the non-local terms. And then they hope for the best. So that's not your typical quantum chemistry procedure, but that, that's what's done, yes. So uh, in case of a molecule problem or uh, a orbital problem of a single atom, uh, these methods, had, did, you, did they produce any uh, reasonable result before? Uh, it's, a, it's a loaded question. Not without <laughs> adjusting your interactions, right? And if all that you're comparing is the energy, and you have interaction parameters that you adjust, you can adjust them to get the right energy, and then that's sort of pointless. Um, but I'll come back to that. Uh, because now that we have this method, right, we can go and we can go back to Lutinger and Warren and we can ask how do we do a better job at this? Like how do we improve, how do we improve on, on the dynamical mean field theory? And um, well, so first of all, a good point to start 
is that rather than saying that you just want to have local interactions, you say that your self-energy should now not just have the local interactions, but subblocks of sigma 1, 1, sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 1, sigma 2, 2, right? Still zero everywhere outside of this diagonal, but I can then group a couple of points, and let me do this in real space, define a couple of points over here, group some of those that are related locally, for example, together, right? My self-energy will still be zero between different blocks, but now I'll have the full non-precarious self-energy within a block. The entire procedure works just the same. The only difference is that rather than having to solve a single order link theory problem, you now have a multi-order link theory problem. In this case, a cluster impurity problem. Typically, the algorithms that we have for solving these impurity problems, they scale exponentially. Uh, in general, there are a couple of ex uh, uh, exceptions. If you're using Monte Carlo impurity solvers, you can get the exact result at time symmetry points like half filling in cubic time, in the interaction strength, cubic time in the system size, and cubic time in the inverse temperature. And then that allows you to go to very, very large systems of hundreds of lattice sites that you can solve with this approximation. It's typically much more precise than what you can do by just discretizing your lattice and looking at this on a periodized uh, lattice system because this is an approximation to the self-energy rather than to the Green's function. And so via the Dyson equation, you will generate a much smoother uh, or a much better idea of what the, what the Green's function is. This goes under uh, either CDMFT for cellular dynamical mean field theory or DCA for dynamical cluster approximation. Both of these are extensions where you start from single side and then you gradually make the correlated subset larger and larger and larger. And ideally, you'll do that until you reach the thermodynamic limit that you converge. And that's not just words. Uh, you can actually do that in practice and you can extrapolate in sort of the boundary terms here and reach thermodynamic uh, limit uh, uh, results for fairly uh, large systems. All right, um, so that's sort of the, the simple most way of extending this. Now, a different way of extending this is, well, you could try to say that those correlations here that you have over here, they exist, but hopefully they're going to be weak. And you can try to formulate a perturbation theory in the non-local corrections to your local self-energy. This is quite a bit of work. The resulting perturbation theory will have uh, vertices that are given by the susceptibility of your impurity problem and Green's function or propagator lines that are given by your Green's function. That goes under the name of the dual fermion approximation and it's really based on taking that part of the self-energy introducing small off-diagonal self-energies and writing down a perturbation theory that will start with the corrections uh, here for the, for the non-local uh, parts. You can also do something that is uh, a little bit smarter than that or a little bit clearer if you're looking at the type of approximation that we've done here, right? Let's go back to the lot of your word functional. And let's just mix and match, right? Because I started with the low order terms that I could do exactly, where I had all of my indices. Uh, Hartree and Falk, and potentially second order terms, there are two of these.
let's take that low order perturbative system and supplement it with the non perturbative DMFT or the non perturbative impurity model answer, right? Where we now have all of the local or local to some orbital block terms up to infinite order. So this is weak coupling perturbation theory combined with non perturbative impurity models or impurity construction. That's going to get you the entire weak coupling answer. And then on top of that, for those orbitals which are strongly correlated, you can get up to infinite order, right? You are still not going to get the exact answer. But you are going to get all of the correlation terms that are coming from higher and higher order diagrams. And now you're back to uh, a method that you can make control, right? So the phi that we're getting, in this case, is the phi of the GF2 plus, let me now sum over all of my, let me call that M correlated subspaces, where I have the phi strong or non perturbative in the subspace I minus the phi EF2 in the subspace I. That here accounts for doubly counting all of these diagrams where the, I have the same indices e, I and I over here, right? If I count them again in my non perturbative method, right, uh, I need to make sure that, that that just happened once in the final answer. That here is called self energy embedding theory. And it now gives you a systematic way of starting from a weak coupling uh, uh, solution supplementing it with a non perturbative method and then by gradually adding more and more orbitals here growing the non perturbative space until you have something that is converged so there are questions here yes Cyrus. Uh, why didn't you put in the gw answer because when we tested it the gw answer was always inferior to the gf2 answer no but why don't you put it in both oh you could you can totally. Yeah, sure, why not? Um, the method that combines second order and GW has, a, has an unfortunate name. It's called SOSEX, second order self consistent exchange, I think. It's not clear. But that's just those. Huh? That's and just the GW plus the GF2 combined, yeah. right? Um, so there are problems with it. It becomes non causal every now and then. And those were things that I just didn't want to uh, deal with. But yeah, you could do that in principle. But I haven't done it. GW itself is pretty. Yes. Running out of time. We're out of time? Running out of time. OK. There were more questions? If not, this is actually a, a good point to sort of recap what we've done. Um, I started by stating a 1960s result, saying that if you have a grand potential, you can write it in terms of these closed linked skeleton diagrams. And then a Another 1960s result that says that if you do that, you can guarantee conservation loss and thermodynamic integration, and coupling constant integration, things like that. So that's a useful starting point for approximations. I then showed you that the bunch of approximations, diagrammatic approximations that we use in practice, namely Hartree Fock, GW, uh, self consistent second order, right, those are approximations of this type. And the dynamical mean field theory can also be formulated uh, in that form. If you formulate the dynamical mean field theory, you have to jump through some hoops and self-consistently solve it in an iterative way 
because the lines that you have in this log ginger work functional are full Gs, not bare Gs. You can do that with an impurity construction uh, that gives you a self energy given a G, and the Dyson equation that gives you a G given a self energy. You iterate this until conversion. In practice, it actually always converges. It's always a surprise why you should do that, but it seems to work. So, the DMFT itself is a little bit tricky because it makes this approximation of checking out all of the non local interactions and all of the non-local self-energies. If your physics is dominated by local contributions, that may be fine. But in general, if you're looking at an electronic structure problem, you really want to have more. So the, you know, two options. One is you just manually adjust your interactions to get an effective interaction that sort of gives you the right thing. Uh, the other thing is you try to combine it with one of the weak coupling methods. And this here, the self-energy embedding theory, gives you exactly how, a prescription of how you combine these. And now you have a powerful method that has a small parameter that systematically converges. And it doesn't just do that in principle, it actually does it in practice. And we have good examples that show that as you add terms to this series, and you make the orbital subspace larger that you consider exactly, that thing actually converges to the right result and is competitive with the most accurate methods that we have for, for chemistry. All right, questions? Yes. So do you break your conservation laws, or are they conserved? No, this is still turns of a phi functional, and therefore, by construction, they satisfy those conservation laws. Right? All of what, what is written in here, all of these are linked, closed, skeleton diagrams. Okay. Right? Uh, Feynman and Kadamas told me that if I write it in this form, I don't need to worry about uh, conservation laws. So these are conserving approximations. Yes. Can you just repeat what those conservation laws are? The ones that are maintained. Hmm? What are the conservation laws that are maintained? Oh. For example. Particle number is a big one. Uh, momentum, yes. angular momentum, and uh, there are five. So there are two more which I don't recall right now. Yes. Are there any constraints on the subsets? of diagrams that you can take and get a self-consistent equation that works? Um, yes. Uh, what kills you is the size of the subspace in here. Right? You have to solve an impurity problem, or you have to solve it non perturbatively right? That, in general, scales exponentially with the system size. So you can do you know, eight or 10 orbitals in here if you're, you know, if you're, if you're good. Uh, if you have a large system, you have hundreds of orbitals. So what you need to do is you need to tile uh, first of all, you need to find a way of identifying the correlated orbitals, right, which you can do by, for example, looking at the density matrix by analyzing it and looking at the entries that are different from 0 and 2. Right? But then you need to be able to resolve that in practice, and then that has a limitation to how far you can go. Yeah. How do you choose the subsets? Looks like you can choose. The, the subset of the cardinals and back. Mm -hmm. How do you choose that? Like, if you, do you choose the number of dotted line, number of loops? Like, how do you? So, in in practice, what you do is you try to find the orbitals that are strongly correlated. Right? You either have physical or chemical intuition what those orbitals are, or you you find a procedure of automatically identifying these orbitals. So what we do in practice is we look at the density matrix. We diagonalize the density matrix. We look at the orbitals that are either completely occupied or completely filled. Those are uncorrelated. They're you know, not so dangerous. We will treat those with a perturbative method. And then we find the ones which are close to one. Right? We define the correlated subspace as the one of those orbitals. That will give us some answer, and then we'll need to gradually grow that subspace to show that it's converged within that. Okay. So you have to so, switch compacting hmm? that subspace. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No more questions? I have one. Um, is it obvious from the diagrammatics why there is, I mean, where is the dynamic? Why is this dynamic? while others are not. How do I... Oh, do, why do is it called that? dynamic? I mean, I know at the end you get sigma of omega. Yeah. yeah. So, you you know, the, I mean, this here is the imaginary time. Uh -huh. Right? Uh, you see that 
the standard mean field theory is instantaneous, mm. right? There's no frequency dependence, there's no how dependence in here. Mm. But once you go to any higher order diagram, you're going to take up some how dependence. That, that's the dynamic hole. All right, so um, we have a half an hour, well, 25 minute coffee break. So let's thank Manuel and come back at four.